Hi, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. My name is Eric Banks. I'm the director of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our uh, roundtable discussion and conversation about Michael Denning's exciting new book, Noise Uprising, The Audio Politics of a World Musical Revolution, which is published by Verso Books. Um, I want to thank everyone who helped us to organize the event tonight and thank Michael especially for coming down uh, from New Haven to join us this evening. Uh, Colin Beckett at Verso has also been uh, instrumental in helping us to put together tonight's event. Uh, so I'm glad to see you all. Um, I've struggled when I've had to, uh, when we put out material promoting the book in a, a number of different ways. For, for one thing, the copy editor in me always wants to stick in a hyphen between world musical and revolution. It just, it's one of those things that it immediately seems that it should be world hyphen musical revolution. But actually the ambiguity between uh, the musical revolution and its relationship to uh, the world and the revolution that we can think of as world musical in uh, connotation and denotation um, is one of the principal t tensions uh, throughout uh, Michael's book. And I think it's one of the things that we'll hear a lot about tonight and I'm very interested to hear you talk about this evening. Um, we also went back and forth, I think, between trying to figure out how to stick an image to this book. Uh, I think in our promotional posters, we used the wonderful picture of, of, of Nipper, the RCA Victor dog, uh, listening to his master's voice. And uh, that's misleading for a number of reasons. Uh, we, I think we're looking for an image that was sort of like the Sherwin-Williams paint logo with We Cover the World. Um, and I pictured radio antenna uh, popping up uh, from various places around the globe, from Jakarta and Buenos Aires uh, and New Orleans and Marseille, uh, and of course that representation doesn't exist either. Uh, how you represent that moment between 1928 and 1933, uh, and it's a great moment of the emergence of uh, musical uh, language vernaculars around the world and their, their uh, dissemination, um, is such a fascinating story, and how to represent it is very much, uh, I think, what Michael's book is about. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome, here this, welcome here, him here this evening and also this wonderful group of people that we have in conversation. Uh, just to tell you very quickly uh, about Michael Denning, he is the William R. Kennan, Jr. Professor of American Studies at Yale University and the co-director of the Initiative on Labor and, and Culture. Among his publications are Culture in the Age of Three Worlds, The Cultural Front, The Laboring of American Culture in the 20th Century, Mechanic Accents, Dime Novels and Working Class Culture in America, and Cover Stories, Narrative and Ideology in the British uh, Spy Thriller. In conversation with him tonight, uh, we're happy to welcome, I uh, think we're going in uh, the order, it's a little bit hard for me to see the names, but uh, which order we'll go in, but we'll be hearing from uh, Brent Hayes Edwards. Um, he is a professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, where he is also affiliated with the Center for Jazz Studies. His books include The Practice of Diaspora, Literature Translation, and The Rise of Black Internationalism, and the co-edited anthology Uptown Conversation, The New Jazz Studies. His new book, Epistro uh, Epistrophes, sorry, Jazz and the Literary Imagination, will be published in 2016. Uh, Alexandra T. Vasquez is w an, a newcomer to New York University. She just started this fall as associate professor in the Department of Performance Studies uh, here at NYU. Her book, Listening in Detail, Performances of Cuban Music, published in 2013, won the American Studies Association's Laura Ro uh, Romero Book Prize in 2014. And finally, Ben Ratliff uh, is a music critic at the New York Times, and he also teaches here in the journalism program at NYU. He's the author of several books, including Coltrane, The Story of a Sound, uh, which was published in 2007, and the forthcoming, and very much forthcoming, um, Every Song Ever, 20 Ways to Listen in an Age of Musical Plenty, which I'm happy to say I've received the galleys uh, of this afternoon. So, Ben, it's great to have you here. Great to have all our panelists. Uh, we're going to begin with a, a presentation by Michael Denning of the, of the book, a bit of an overview, and then we'll have a uh, set of uh, comments and uh, discussion before we turn it over to you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, yes, and thank you to all of you for joining in this. Uh, both of those things, I've fought with the copy editors about the hyphen on several books going back to working class culture. And we fought over images about what kind of image to put on this. Anyway, so I'd like to just begin, keep this short, but I'll give you a musical montage of a set of clips and then briefly outline a couple of the arguments of the book. 
In October of 1925, the first commercial recordings of Afro-Cuban song took place in Havana, as Victor recorded the Sexteto Habanero with its three string players, trace guitar and bass, and three percussionists, bongo, clave, and maracas. <laughs> Five years, hundreds of recordings of son sextetos and septetos, which added a trumpet, were recorded, and Afro-Cuban music re resonated around the world under the name, a somewhat misleading name, of rumba. About two weeks later, in Chicago, O.K. recorded a young trumpet player from the Delta city of New Orleans, Louis Armstrong, with his Hot Five, a jazz quintet. Though there had been a number of earlier recordings of African-American jazz musicians, the 90 or so race records made by Armstrong with his Hot Five and later Hot Seven, added tuba and drums, over the next five years became the embodiment of hot jazz, not least the trumpet cadenza that opens West End Blues. spring, a young singer from another cotton-growing delta, Um Kulthum, recorded ten discs for gramophone in Cairo with a new ensemble of kanun, violin, oud, and reek, and a new repertoire based on the colloquial poetry of Ahmed Rami. This recording of Nkunt Asamin, if I, were, if I Were to Forgive, sold unprecedented numbers of copies when it was released in 1928. That fall, the young Eurasian singer and dancer of Jakarta's popular theater, Miss Ribowit, recorded a number of Kronchen tunes for the German label Bika and became the first great recording star of the Dutch East Indies, soon to be the new nation of Indonesia, with songs like the 1928 Kronchen Dardanella. <laughs> fall, Kalama's Quartet, a Hawaiian ensemble featuring steel guitarist and falsetto, falsetto singer Mike Hanapi recorded Inishi Nishi Malie for OK Records in New York. <laughs> National vogue for Hawaiian music had been triggered a decade earlier. It consisted mainly of Tin Pan Alley tunes with mock Hawaiian lyrics. <laughs> 
Uh, the recordings of Kalama's quartet and a few others at this time really led to the international circulation of discs by Hawaiian artists. Within six months, Brunswick had sent engineers to Honolulu to make the first commercial recordings in Hawaii. And by 1929, steel guitarist Tao Moe and his family ensemble were performing throughout the Asia and the Pacific and recording in Tokyo as Madame Riviere's Hawaiians. In January 1928, the first commercial series of West African recordings, the Zonophone EZ series, were, record, were released in Gold Coast towns like Accra. One of the tunes recorded by the Kumasi Trio was Ya Aponsa, which was to become a standard of Ghanaian High Life. That same spring, a young Tarab singer from the East African port of Zanzibar, Siti Binti Saad, traveled with her group to Bombay to make the first commercial recordings in Swahili. Over the next three years, she made dozens of recordings in Bombay, Mombasa, and Zanzibar, and became the most revered Tarab performer in East Africa. Only a handful of her recordings remain in circulation. This is Weiwei Paka, You Cat, probably recorded in 1930. <laughs> At the same time in Paris, the 18-year-old gypsy virtuoso Django Reinhardt, who'd become well-known in the dance halls of working-class Paris, playing banjo guitar in the accordion-fronted bands of Parisian musette, was first recorded accompanying a musette accordionist. Uh, Django, I think, is there in the lower right. Later that year, Parlophone used the new electrical process to record the great Brazilian Choro composer and flautist Pichenga, here shown on the far right with his batutas. Among the recordings was the classic tune, Carinosa. <laughs> Pichinga had returned to Rio following his success in Paris and become Victor's house arranger and band leader. And by 1932, he was the band leader for Brazilian radio's first program to feature samba. And finally, though I could go on, the book has about 25 or 30 of these episodes at the opening. 
In October of 1930, Griffiths Matsuyaloa arrived in London from South Africa to organize a pioneering session of recordings of South African Marabi and vaudeville tunes for the South African market, beginning with his own Abuti Nico, Brother Nico, it's a different label, I've never been able to get the label of this, with its yodels and Hawaiian guitar. <laughs> The book began when I noticed this remarkable coincidence of these recording sessions. A child of the folk revival of the 1960s, I was long knew the recordings of race and hillbilly music that had been collected into Harry Smith's legendary anthology of American folk music. But I was surprised and intrigued by the fact that the early recordings of so many what were coming to be thought of as roots musics took place in such a brief time period. When I began, there were really three ways of thinking about these musics. First, that they were tourist musics, a metropolitan craze for exotic musics for far away, a kind of musical aspect of colonialism. As a result, their audio politics, if any, were reactionary. Second, that they were echoes of American jazz part of the spread of American mass culture around the world, and with only a few exceptions, Django Reinhardt is one of those, uninteresting imitations of American jazz, a line of argument emblemized in some way by the well-known essays of Theodore Adorno. And third, that they were part of a gradual and natural emergence of national roots musics out of native folk musics. But as I explored the musics, none of these actually held up. For the most part, these recordings, though issued by multinational recording companies, were aimed almost entirely at local markets and not at the imperial metropolises of New York, London, Paris, or Berlin. Moreover, though they were often called jazz, that word, along with the other new words floating around, tango, cronchin, hula, rumba, gypsy, flamenco, in various combinations. One can find cronchin rumbas, hula blues, jazz tangos, covered a host of idioms that didn't sound like American jazz and were not part of any American mass culture. And third, despite their subsequent neat separation into national traditions, Brazilian samba, Argentine tango, Hawaiian hula, Indonesian cronchin, they were strangely interconnected. Consider, for example, the guitarist Oscar Aleman, Born in Argentina in 1909, but orphaned in Brazil, he began by playing the Brazilian cavaquino. In his teens, he formed a Hawaiian duo, Le Lu, He's on the left here, which recorded tangos for Argentine Victor. On the label, it says Hawaiian guitar, national repertoire. Lelou went on to Europe in 1929 as a Hawaiian music duo, but Aleman went on to lead a swing quintet, which recorded sambas. He later joined the Baker Boys, the band that backed Josephine Baker. Aleman might be seen as a marginal figure to each of these musics, neither jazz nor Hawaiian, neither samba nor tango. Alternately, he might be taken as the quintessential figure of this new music, fusing Buenos Aires and Rio by way of Honolulu and Harlem. So my book has three arguments about the musics of this noise uprising. First, an argument about where they came from and when. 
These were urban dance musics that emerged out of the musical cultures of an archipelago of colonial ports linked by steamship lines, here mapped by Rand McNally in 1924. In these ports, artisan reading musicians, often of distinct ethnic and racial communities, encountered street ear musicians, often migrants from rural hinterlands, in a world of parading carnival bands and sacred singers, far from the cultural capitals of the musical guilds. And they emerged in a remarkably brief window of time, Though historians, if you go looking for the first blues or the first tango, you will get back to the acoustic recordings made before World War I. It was really the moment between the invention of electrical recording in 1925 and the onset of the Great Depression that saw these musics rise and fall as a worldwide recording phenomenon. Second, these musical idioms are best understood not as the emergence of a music industry, that goes back to early capitalism, nor as an undifferentiated popular music, but as a vernacular revolution, not unlike the vernacular revolutions in language which were tied to the new technology of the printing press. The musics are distinct but interrelated idioms just as French, Spanish, and Italian inherited common structures from the sacred script of Latin, but developed into distinct languages with distinct literatures, so samba, tango, hula, marabi, crunch, and, and jazz shared an inheritance, not least the ambivalent relation to the prestigious philharmonic musics which European colonialism had circulated through the ports but also distinguish distinctive timbres, rhythmic vocabularies, and repertoires. However, I think one can discern three distinct musical influences of these interconnected idioms. A group of musics of the Black Atlantic, shaped by the movement of Africans to the Americas in the slave trade, a group of idioms across the Mediterranean that were shaped by the traveling Roma peoples, the so-called gypsy musics from flamenco to zagan, and a group of idioms that developed across the ports of the Pacific, influenced by a host of Polynesian musics, but usually characterized as Hawaiian. <coughs> These vernacular musical idioms remade the musical ear. It's not that they were the same music, but that their common articulation of noisy timbres that fused local percussion with industrially produced instruments, their distinctive rhythm sections that created a host of syncopated rhythmic dialects and weird vernacular tonalities, and their celebration of a kind of paradoxical or oxymoronic recorded improvisations marked, I would say, a Copernican revolution in music, reversing the relation between printed and notated music and recorded music, and between the cultivated musics of aristocratic elites and the vernacular musics of ordinary people. And finally, these musical idioms and the phonograph cultures constituted a decolonization of the ear. Following a line of thought among Marxist music critics from Ernst Bloch to Jacques Attali, which have argued for the prophetic and utopian nature of music, I suggest that political decolonization, the decolonization of territories and legislatures, depended on a cultural revolution an iconoclasm that smashed the aesthetic idols of everyday life, the ordinary hierarchies and inequalities that depended on common sense ideologies of race, color, civilization. The enfranchisement of these musics inscribed on shellac discs and circulated around the world is a fundamental part of the making of new sensibilities. Let me just mention two ways in which this was manifested. 
In some cases, there were direct connections and engagement with anti-colonial thought, as events and figures in anti-colonial struggles became the subject of popular recordings. One example is Trinidad, where a number of calypsos were recorded about Uriah Butler and the Butler riots, as they were called, part of the massive Caribbean strike wave that hit the British Empire in 1937 and led to a major colonial investigation. In early 1938, the Calypso singer Raymond Cavedo, who called himself Attila the Hun, he's in the middle in this picture, took up the strikes in a series of songs. The first was a critique of that Colonial Commission report. I'll play the last two of the the last two of the verses. This is This was banned in Trinidad, but he responded with two songs that couched his story in praise songs for the two colonial officials who had been dismissed for being too sympathetic to the workers. And then two weeks later, he recorded and released a more guarded narrative of the strike. <laughs> Strikes and the rats, so I wasn't there, was the most regrettable affair. I'll now entertain you with a song. I don't know who is right or who is wrong. Different versions have been stated as to how the strikes originated. Well, you may draw your own conclusion. Attila will reserve his opinion. Nevertheless, this kind of direct political commentary by musicians is perhaps the least significant part of the Cultural Revolution work by these musics. We can't deduce the anti-colonial meaning of a record from its lyrics or the musician's politics. Often the most innocuous songs carried anti-colonial connotations in the eyes of the authority and of the population alike. And this is particularly true of one of the most common song forms, the romantic lyric tribute to the land, built on the simple musicality of place names. Such songs make up much of the repertoire of commercial Hawaiian music and are usually understood as a kind of tourist picturesque. There seems to be little political meaning, for instance, in the place name chant, Namoka Ea, the Four Islands, recorded by Kalama's quartet, among others. <laughs> Its verses invoke the flower lay of each island and its characteristic mountain before concluding with the simple, this is the end of my song of the four islands of the Pacific. However, if one recalls that the form of Kalana Naupua, famous are the flowers, the emblem of Hawaiian resistance, a song that was not recorded or republished in Hawaii between the establishment of the settler regime in the 1890s and the 1950s. That song alternated the song's political descent no one will fix a signature to the paper of the enemy with its sin of annexation and the sale of the civil rights of the people, 
with verses that were a place name chants. Hawaii, land of Kauai answers, the bays of Pilani, ah, help, all are united by the sands of Kakuhuea. Perhaps the Kalama Quartet's place name song of the four islands of the Pacific carried its own kaona, the inner or hidden meaning, the shadow or unwritten verse on the rights of the people. Given the centrality of land to colonial dispossession and given the unambiguous association of many Hawaiian lyrics, including the oft-recorded Aloha Oe with the deposed and imprisoned Lili Ukalani, the reclaiming in the Hawaiian language of the winds, waters, and rains of Hanalei may have been as powerful an anti-colonial lyric as Attila's humorous calypsos about Butler's riots. Music constitutes subjects as social subjects. The rhythms of songs, dances, and marches merge bodies and voices. One might say that a people or movement must be constituted musically before they can be constituted politically. If, as Benedict Anderson suggested three decades ago, the nationalisms of the 18th and 19th century depended on the books and newspapers of a print capitalism, perhaps the popular movements of the era of decolonization depended ironically on the electrical acoustics of a sound capitalism and on the new urban plebeian musics they circulated around the world. The decolonization of the ear made possible the decolonization of the territory. Well, I guess my first reaction is that this is a book about music from a very long time ago, but, um, but it's very much a book of now um, because <clears throat> so much has been sifted through and so much is available. There will be more. There's always more. But I, I, I kept thinking, what would this book have been like if, it, if somebody had tried to write it 25 years ago? I mean, I suppose it could have been done, but it would have been a lot harder. It would have taken a lot more time. And also, as a reader, um, you can hear these things that he's writing about quite easily. And that certainly wasn't the <coughs> case. And um, you know, I guess one consequence of this book is that I'm, I'm, ne I'm probably not going to hear Louis Armstrong again without thinking about Saul Hu P.E. and, um, you know, uh, Carlos Gardel and all the other music that was being made in Shanghai and Lisbon and Accra and so on. Um, that's the way it should always have been. And the reason it hasn't been is because of, um, well, business and political reasons. Um, the, the book, where it hit me most, really, is, is that it seems to be, at least half of the book anyway, is a book about misunderstandings, you know? Um, uh, it's about, um, and, and the intellectuals uh, weren't necessarily any help, you know? <laughs> um, uh, recording music didn't ensure its purity. It didn't put it on the map and give it, um, <coughs> you know, um, unchangeable landmark status. Recording it immediately uh, threw it out there and made it subject to change and subject to um, misinterpretation. And um, the misunderstandings about this music, this this noise, this m you know, this m all this mixed activity happening in port cities, um, sometimes I think is positive and generative and creative, and sometimes oh silly. I don't know if it's destructive, but it's silly and um, and, in, and and silly in a way that may not even be specific to its own time and place. You know, I mean, as I was reading this book over the weekend. I was talking to somebody I know, and and he was telling me about what he listens to, and 
and I felt like I was talking to a Dorno. You know, this guy just was saying, I, I, I can't deal with hip hop. It, it, <coughs> it, it, you know, it, uh, and the reasons he couldn't deal with hip hop were because, um, oh, you know, it wasn't authentic, and it, it, it was, it, it, it seemed like it was all just gonna. It wasn't going to last. I mean, you know, every new star you hear isn't going to last. It all seems disposable. It's not real music, etc. And um, these things are always happening. I mean, this kind of misunderstanding is always happening. I also would love to bring up, I didn't go to graduate school, so I feel safe in asking this question. But I wonder when, I mean, is there a time when we can just eject Adorno from conversations about <laughs> popular <Boy>. music? <laughs> no. I, I don't know. I feel like he, he's almost always wrong. Um, anyway, uh, also, I love the fact that in this book, you know, you, you have a historian saying um, uh, the Victrola was really the only source of entertainment uh, for uh, working class Puerto Rican families in the 1930s. <coughs> Um, things like that, and you you realize that you really realize the the, cent the centrality of records in home in the home all over the place, um, as opposed to n now. I was thinking when to listen to a record is sort of an act of privilege. You know, I mean, I guess <laughs> when we talk about listening to, I mean, I mean, if something vinyl. You know, I guess we're talking about an LP. You need you need time for that. You need space for that. I mean, you need you need like a room. You need equipment. You need money. Uh, so things have just sort of turned completely other, the other way. Anyway, this book is going to be a, a resource for me, an index of um, all kinds of people meeting this new music all over the world. Good evening, everyone. First, I want to thank Eric for the invitation to be here today and for Michael for giving us yet another window into your amazing brain. Thank you so much. Um, I have a script because I find when I don't have a script, I get in trouble. Um, but I'll try to keep it brief. And one thing I wanted to say, Ben, is not even 25, even 10 years ago, this book would have been impossible to imagine. Where just, I started. And, and that's when you started, <laughs> exactly. So I know once it came out, it's like, oh, God, you can just pull this stuff up now. And it's. Um, anyways, so it took me a long time to read this book because it demands that we listen in parallel to the phenomena that Denning so strikingly and with inspiring gumption sets to page. Noise uprising encourages a compound ear, and what I was trying to get after is the way the fly sees, but, uh, it, but in the eardrum, um, that can take in whole phonic fields at once. It asks that we bracket any sense of comfort of the thorough and singular case study. Attention that animates this book animates us and most, if not all, books on music is how music makes singular case studies impossible. We've got to do this work with an ethos of listening to everything at once. As someone who is trained by the Caribbean and its gulfs, I've learned how not to see that as a problem but a challenge, a kind of hallucinogenic challenge that requires leap of faith, leaps of pen, leaps of teaching. To read slow is to read careful. This is perhaps a stubborn, labor-intensive feminist practice that at once prohibits one from just reading stuff and moving on, as it is from just saying stuff and moving on. That is the dream, of course, for the overworked that live in women of color criticism to rest, even for a minute, in the fantasy land of mastery. But so many that linger in the lines of Denning's important study demand that we keep working. What this book has helped me to continue refining in my critical practice is something different than close reading, which betrays my adult onset allergy to the English departments. Nor do I want to forcibly translate close reading into a sonic register, say, by eking out and making transparent music's vitalizing mysteries as a verifiable close listening. What I'm after is something less penetrative. To not use who might go missing in any account as a utility to correct, nor to remain complacent in the getting mad when she doesn't get enough time on the stage. <laughs> 
So as one shimmering example, I'm so grateful for that you played her now. I'm so grateful to you, Michael, uh, for making possible the Um Kulthum portal in this work with her pioneering durational performances live and in recording and her eloquent um, and elegant delinquency to my ear and overall comportment. And I have to say, go, get, go into her rabbit hole on YouTube because she's got this incredible archive and most amazing is this five minute interview she gave after she gave a concert in, at the Olympia Theater, I think in 65 in Paris, and she only gave the TV channel five minutes and, and didn't speak during most of it, but she looked amazing. <laughs> um, so being introduced to her, and I realize how ridiculous it is that I'm just now really being introduced to her, to this most important musician of the 20th century, even as I've long overheard her, is yet another occasion to get lost in all the time that women protagonists of the musical stories require. Noise Uprising helps me to better understand my training by the Caribbean and its gulfs as a necessary rehearsal for her. This is because some of the things that are inside of Kultum's performances, how she makes us wait for her voice in recording and in scholarship, because we have to be ready for it, which will never be. How Kultum appears and doesn't in this narrative in so many ways doesn't matter because the fact of Denning putting her there allows her to mess with his arguments and with those who are still trying to force singular argumentative protocols upon a book like this, on geographies and water currents such as ours. The argument is necessary, and I appreciate, Michael, you, you know, taking me through it, but I, I kind of love the way it was hard for me to locate, um, and it felt like a necessary um, move on your part because of Kultum and because of its women performers and because Denning leaves himself open to her and to them. So what I really want to say, again, um, I'll say by one of the most crucial lines in the book, for this is the line that can turn us back to performers. So Denning writes, quote, the anti-colonial meaning of a record often lay neither in the politics of the musician nor of its lyrics, but in the way its very sound disrupted the hierarchical orders and patterns of deference that structured colonial and settler societies. So it's very sound. That was like a... That was like a bomba that just um, opened up a lot for me. And I think that's in like the fifth chapter no, in the decolonizing the ear part. So I always, um, I always want to turn back to performers and what they're doing, not for the enterprise of meaning making, not for some false fidelity that we can connote about an artist's intention, but what they literally do to us as we write about them. I'm constantly turning to performers because they're hard, because women vocalists make theory even and especially when they're not given the value judgment of a real-time biography or autobiography, because they turn my job into a never-ending education. I also want to insist on the dancers here to the view from their shore, not Marx's titillation, but their acts of cancanery. Denning gives us the opportunity to, re to rethink, gives us an opportunity to rethink a mutant strain of masculinist scholarship called sound studies who trace music through equipment. The book urges us to wonder about all the wonder created by the real innovations that women musicians make that are later smoothed out and made conventional in the history of sound recording. Denning gives us an ample list to work with in this book. As I read, I kept thinking about Maria Teresa Vera, and I don't know if we can pull up her image uh, of the Occidente. Um, I kept thinking about Maria Teresa Vera for one who, you gotta, no, 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 I'm just, I, I need y'all to pay attention to this visual because she's in, hold on, it's her with the guitar, she's total badass. Um, I kept on thinking about her for one who, and, uh, and actually so much of New York musical culture comes from her. Um, so for one who anticipated something of the bands of silence, what Severo Sardui liked to call playas, that separate songs on a long play. She did so by prefiguring her songs with some unspoken transition um, made by the furious scraping of her guitar for a few measures. How might Rosita Quiroga's soprano and the intense proliferation of the sopranos, which incidentally is a stirring subset of the port intellectuals, change the sense of the studio during this time period? The Cuban scene, especially Rita Montaner, really messes with us because she is one of the countless Cuban performers, then and now, who take the vernacular and the solfege, the popular and the classical, not as modes of identification, but mere idioms to play with. 
So alas, the mutant strain of sound studies is a gender bomb shelter where I find many of my comrades. So I say to my comrades with a kind of humor and seriousness with which we say, drunk or sober, abajo el imperialismo, humor, because women, and especially women artists, and aesthetics generally, still somehow don't register within the seriousness of the political category. Serious, because I don't have the energy to be militant anymore, and because I'm just now getting Lord's master's tools. What I want to say in the spirit of Denning's great post colon title, The Audio Politics of a World Musical Revolution, is not to say anything really, but to hold up a refractive speaker, a blast of women's vocals and dance moves, of what women do with their very sound that sounds everything at once. So thanks again to Michael. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here, and I want to thank uh, Eric and the Institute also for the invitation. Um, it's a real pleasure, well, first of all, to read the book, but also to be able to say a few words about it. I will also be brief. Um, in summary, the book is an astonishing accomplishment in what I call synthetic uh, music history, but it's also an ear-opening, transformative argument about the history of recording and the political impact of popular music. Uh, I'm not going to try to summarize it or give an overview. What I thought I'd do is just hone in on a couple of issues, really a couple of keywords, as ways to enter into a discussion with Michael about uh, some of the implications of the work. And really what I'm going to try to do is extend or annotate or offer a couple of extra extraneous after the fact footnotes uh, to this extraordinary book. The first thing I wanted to talk about that I've been thinking about a lot since reading the book is the choice of the term vernacular. And it's a major part of the argument that the central musical revolution of the 20th century is not all these musics, sones, hula, tango, uh, kong, samba, blues, jazz, tarab. They're not popular musics. They're not best described as folk musics, as root musics. They're best described as vernacular musics. And as Michael was saying uh, in his introductory remarks, for him, the vernacular music revolution, as he terms it, he calls it that because he says it's analogous to the tectonic shift from Latin to the European vernacular languages in the 15th and 16th century. He says the term vernacular inserts a linguistic detour between art form and people, reminding us not only that music is a kind of language, that when you perform, when you improvise a jazz standard, you're performing in an idiom that you share with your fellow performers, but that there are recognizable idioms of music. In. Languages and musics travel across borders and oceans. They give rise to pigeons, creoles, and dialects. Now that's an argument by analogy, which is interesting and I think crucial to the way the book develops, but I wanted to kind of resist the al analogy or take the analogy back the other way, I guess as a professor of comparative literature, um, which I'm supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> what about the language part of it? If it's not just that music is like language or music functions as a language for the performers, but we think about music also as a vehicle of language. If part of the revolution of in what he calls vernacular uh, music involves the circulation of these records to Rio and Shanghai, he says, as much as to Paris and Berlin, um, that that's fundamental to the decolonization of the ear. I'm especially interested in that, what I call cross-colonial circulation. How to make sense of the Cuban rumba records that end up in Dakar and Kinshasa. So not even though, as he argues very convincingly and points out, these international recording companies are making records in various global locales for local audiences. Part of the revolutionary part of the revolution is that they move across borders in interesting and unpredictable ways. So it might be made in Cuba, but end up in South America, or end up in Asia, or end up in Africa. Um, if you think about it that way, and think about the language element, the language vernaculars, then the point has to be that vernacular music is a vehicle for the spread of linguistic vernaculars. So you think of the hipster linguo and the viper language in Louis Armstrong's heebie-jeebies, or Sweet Sue, or Lumfardo in Argentine tango, or uh, the Adokin dialect of Spanish unleashed 
in Sones or in Flamenco. Um, going through, these are small moments, but they pass by quickly and aren't, aren't quite elaborated, which is why I want to dwell on them for a second. Uh, a couple of examples that come up quickly. In the two Congos, Michael says at one point, there are stories of musicians calling out the songs by their GV number, so their gramophone Victor catalog number, rather than their Spanish titles. That tells us something about how the West African musics are hearing the language in the Latin American or the Caribbean Spanish music. Um, he says elsewhere, the ethnomusicologist Mantle Hood once noted the paradox that whereas outside Hawaii, the timbre of the steel guitar became the emblem of Hawaii, inside Hawaii, it was the vocal timbre of the sung words that was considered the most important aspect of the music. And the simple reason is because as we just heard, if you don't speak the language, it's hard to understand what they're saying in a lot of the songs. So if you think about the impact of something like Cuban rumba or son in Dakar, the impact must have to do with the fact that you don't entirely understand the words. This, this is sort of related to what Ben was saying about incomprehension or misunderstanding. But to me, the point has to be that in the circulation of this vernacular musical revolution from the language perspective, opacity and incomprehension has to be crucial. And I think it's crucial because what it does when you can't, when you listen to music and languages, sung music and languages you can't understand, it focuses your attention on the timbral elements. It makes you hear the voice. You don't understand Um Kuntum's Arabic, but you hear the way she inflects Arabic. Mm -hmm. And you know that it's a communicative medium that she's operating in. You know that something's uh, so that something's being said, but you can't quite grasp it. What it makes you pay attention to is the way she says it, the way she delivers it. Um, the other footnote that I wanted to add is, or comment, is in relation to the argument that Michael summarized about the relationship between what he calls really evocatively and powerfully decolonizing the ear on the one hand and anti-colonialism in the political or what one might call proper territorial sense on the other. And to me, it's something I've talked to you a little bit about this. It's something that I've worked on a little bit and have thought about a lot. And it, it still is something that I have a lot of trouble getting my head around even after, uh, even with the help of Michael's book. I'm convinced reading the book that the battle over the ear, as he writes, was central to the struggle over colonialism. I'm also convinced that vernacular music's brought about <coughs> a somatic decolonization, as he puts it, the decolonization of the ear and the dancing body. Although that's something I think we could talk about a lot more, <laughs> because although I think I know what that means, on another level, I'm not entirely sure what it means to decolonize a body. Um, <laughs> we can talk about it more. I, I also am convinced, I think, that when he says, I want to suggest that the phonograph was equally important to decolonization, that vernacular gramophone music was a herald of decolonization, part of a cultural revolution that made possible the subsequent pr political revolution. The conundrum, though, is that the anti-colonial theorists and activists who, as he says, I'm quoting him again, forged the very notion that decolonization was a cultural as well as a political revolution felt a profound ambivalence about these musics. They didn't get it. And I think it's not an overstatement to say across the board they <laughs> didn't get it. Fanon didn't get it. C.L.R. James didn't get it. Cabral didn't get it. Ho Chi Minh didn't get it. Nehru didn't get it. Gandhi didn't get it. Padmore didn't get it. Kenyatta didn't get it. <laughs> and Kruma didn't get it. I could go on. There's one quote that's the epigraph that then he repeats in the book from Fanon. It's the one moment that's the closest in Fanon, um, where Fanon says, well before the political or armed struggle, a careful observer could sense and feel in the fields of dance, song, rituals, and traditional ceremonies, the pulse of a fresh stimulus and the coming combat. Now that sounds cool, but I don't think <coughs> Fanon is talking about commercial recording. No, he probably isn't right there. I'm pretty sure he isn't. <laughs> and whether he is or not, in the rest, <laughs> rest of the Wretched of the Earth, aside from that paragraph, that's not what he does. He doesn't give us an analysis or even the tools to do an analysis of uh, if there is such a thing as a vernacular music revolution. That, to me, Michael's book convinces me there is. Um, 
that we need to attend to. So I'm left with that conundrum of if this is so crucial in preparing the ground for political decolonization in the proper sense or the territorial mm -hmm. sense, why are all the key figures um, of the advent of the independent struggles missing it? And I think the answer, uh, well, I'm curious to see what <laughs> Michael will think, um, has to do with another part of his argument that I think is really powerful, that this vernacular musical revolution happies, happens in port cities. Mm -hmm. Because if we follow the work of people who've written about the history of anti-colonial thought, from C.L.R. James to Edward Said, uh, Raymond Williams, Stuart Hall, Simon Gakandi, the argument over and over again is that one crucial element in the formation of the class of anti-colonial intellectuals is experience in the metropoles. In other words, uh, this is a complicated thing and difficult to generalize about, but to a large degree, they're not there in the port cities. They're in Paris or London or New York. They're in the major metropol met metropolises. Um, that raises an interesting possibility, which I'd like to hear Michael talk about, when he says that part of what made the vernacular music revolution possible was its distance from the colonial metropolis that it wasn't in London and Paris. It was happening in Buenos Aires, or in Fort de France, or in Dakar, uh, or in Marseille. Um, is it possible to say, to, to suggest that in terms of the anti-colonial intellectual class, the formation of that group that proved so pivotal to political um, independence, that there is also a necessary distance from the vernacular music revolution? What they're hearing in Paris and London are what you call the vogue for primitivism and exoticism, exoticism in the modern, modernist countercultures of the metropoles. <coughs> and what it leads to, I think, is, and it's, it's scattered throughout the quotes in the book, um, Andre Nardal and Begin in Paris, this kind of reaction formation where they're angry, they're annoyed at uh, the commercialization and the exoticism and the primitive, primitive uh, the banalization of these musics. Um, it doesn't lead to an attention to or coming to terms with that vernacular uh, music in the port cities, but it does lead to what Said calls maybe the formation of, of a defensive nationalism of the exile. Mm -hmm. And what I think would be cool, if, if you will accept my, <laughs> my annotation, is that this extension of the argument would mean that Whereas the vernacular music revolution primes the home audiences, the defensive exilic nationalism of the intellectual class creates that kind of, through that reaction formation, creates the kind of honing of an intellectual message that then, then Kenyatta goes back to Kenya, then Nkrumah goes to Ghana, right? Um, and you find that meeting of a populace whose ears have been de and bodies have been decolonized by the vernacular music revolution of the commercial music they're dancing to, and the intellectual class who's been formed in a completely different way, but coming into contact with that mass. Sorry, that's long-winded, but, and it's, a, it's an extension of what Michael does, but uh, it's the only way I can make sense of what for me is a conundrum that I don't know how to think my way out of in coming to terms with people like Fanon and Jameson and Krumah. Uh, and Cabral, whose work I respect so much and consider so pivotal. I'll stop there. So let me, because I want to throw this to out. To, uh, this is uh, it's great to hear all of this. Thank you. Partly because I, I think I've said, when I wrote The Cultural Front some numbers of years ago, <laughs> I meant that as a book to end all debates. People have been arguing about the old <laughs> left for a long time and like this was the final word. It didn't do it. This book is a really different thing. Actually, uh, this is meant to start and debate and start it. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that's wrong in it. I'm writing about <laughs> musics and languages I don't understand or whatever. And so in that sense, this is, uh, is really good. So let me just say, th take one thing from the three because I could be here all night answering everything. Though, um, because I think the Adorno and the Fanon is really the same issue in some sense, which is the, the, the you know, intellectuals did misunderstand this and sort of how, to, how does one think about it? And I guess partly what I would say is, though I'm taken by your argument why specific intellectuals had one kind of experience there, that I do think, for me, this is not just 
the same as resistance to a new generation of popular music. I think this really is the making of a different way of living with music in the world. That is partly the technology has a lot to do with it, but it also the fact that it then coincides with the with decolonization and the kind of cultural revolution that changes the relation of cultures of peoples around the world. I think the two things together make it so we will never hear music again in the same way. And that's why for me, you can't get rid of Adorno. Adorno is the Geiger counter. The fact, because he actually, and in some ways for him he's like Carpentier, because there are a few people who are, because they have some kind of musical training, who do hear this stuff more than the Fanons and the Jameses uh, and, the, and probably some of the other Frankfurt School people who weren't interested in music particularly. But with Carpentier or with Adorno, there is a sense of actually sensing this. Adorno, when he describes the music, is actually a very good describer mm -hmm. of it. He just doesn't like the way it sounds. <laughs> and that, I think, is, is, and, and is a kind of interest of how important. And for us, for me, that's some of the ways it's now too easy to listen to it. I feel like we've grown up because it's the result of this uh, musical revolution. So in some ways, these don't sound strange enough. So that would be one point. Mm -hmm. The second one I'll just say on the language and the opacity, I think actually in some ways that is about listening to music in languages that you don't understand. But I think that the opacity of the lyrics is there in musics, popular and high. I'm absolutely certain it is true of opera at one level that you don't get all of those words. And I can certainly, from the early days of trying to figure out what Bob Dylan was really <laughs> saying uh, and, and, and liking the fact that he never put the lyric sheet in, he wanted you to try to figure out what that was and where those ambiguities that I think that that point about the opacity of it. Um, the, I do feel like the other thing is I have been writing uh, with the examples of the other people at the table as alternative ways of doing this. And in some sense, that it does seem to me the, the sense of, the diff of trying to figure out how you do listening to everything and listening in detail. You know, that was for me always the failing of the book, is that I don't actually get to the detail. Uh, and finally decided, well, no, I'll just do what I can do. But the <laughs> trick of, of sort of how, to, how one moves back and forth between trying to make that kind of uh, synthetic or, or that kind of argument without it just being an attempt to sort of put everyone in their place, which I hope is not the purpose of the book or the effect of the book, but actually to kind of open up the different ways in which the musics are speaking to each other. But I felt like if I actually stayed with any of those voices long yes. enough to listen in detail. <laughs> You're screwed. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. That's a 20 volume <laughs> set right there, yeah. exactly. <laughs> But that's what's great about the kind of temporality of reading. Yeah. Is it takes yeah. a long time, right. yeah. and it should take a long time. Yeah. And I think, I think, and I think there yeah. are interesting things that, be, by trying to listen across them, you do hear different things. That, that, um, but even hearing your, you know, hearing the Attila the Hun, that, that calypso. I mean, for me, but hearing it in this context, I was like, oh my God, that's done song. That sounds just like the, the kind of ways that the flutes were coming together and the orchestration. I was like, oh, and I just, it's, it kind of makes a suggestion of all these ports or all these places to be in the room at the same time, um, rather than a kind of list. Anyway. So, yeah, let's throw it out to... Sure. Let me take the uh, start with Jerry. Um, can you do this without the mic? Is it, I think we're small enough. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about the decolonization of the ear, which is such a fascinating uh, um, notion. But my question is, whose ear is being decolonized? It seems to me there are two choices. I, I, I don't suppose you would believe that the ear of the people, for instance, who are sitting in this photograph in front of us had ever been colonized in the first place. Um, I think I would be surprised if I thought that their ear had, ears had been decolonized. Um, so it's not their ears that are being decolonized. 
they're, they, they already have this music. It's, it's their music. Um, and so then the question becomes, are there other people's ears who are somehow decolonized by listening to this music? And can, could you tell us how that happens? <laughs> yes. That, no, it is their ears. And in fact, the first time I ever gave a piece of this when I didn't know much of it and I was just trying to try it out, I was somewhere in Indiana, I think, and someone asked me exactly that question in a much more hostile tone, I might add. <laughs> and, and it really took me aback, and I went to it, and no, in fact, the colonization of the ear is a fundamental part of colonialism. There was a real effort that the musical part of colonialism, both in the creation of hymn singing congregations around the world and the brass bands around the world, and these musicians, for the most part, come indeed out of those institutions. They often get their training in those brass bands. They get their training. Uh, this double quartet is basically coming <laughs> out of putting ragtime piano together with him singing. And so in some ways, and partly because these are the people, unlike the more uh, people in further in the hinterlands, farther from the impact of colonialization. In the colonial ports, these are the musicians who in many ways are most inflicted by the project of a kind of musical colonialization. It is an incomplete one. One of the great accounts of it that I use in the book is in Gandhi's autobiography, where Gandhi tells that he decides at one point he'd better learn how to, to play the violin, and he buys it, and he takes, and he says, I can't keep the time. And it's kind and he gives up on trying to uh, become uh, acculturated into Western music. And so I think actually that the project and the battle over that, and this ends up being a weird kind of hybrid music that is in part built out of the, the mass-produced instruments that are coming out of the catalogs, those guitars and whatever, together virtually all of these musics mix those mass-produced instruments with some kind of local percussion instruments or local string instruments. Uh, Robert Thompson, who did the book on tango, said tango was the only one that didn't have that. I don't know whether that's true, where all the, all the instruments were actually, though even the bandoneon is such a weird, not kind of a, though it is an industrial produced free read, so. I just got the book yesterday, so I'm not that far into it, I'm about 78 pages, and I'm so impressed by it, and I want to ask, about the research, um, because you cover so much ground, maybe it goes to your point about close reading, detail, synthetic. And I guess I don't, I, my question is not so much how did you do the research, but how did you know how to do it? In other words, you know, if you're working on the spy thriller, there's a corpus, and maybe there's surprises to it, but how did you even know how to proceed with something that's as open, amorphous, so many circuits of interaction? I, actually, I learned that when I, it was the dime novel book. If you're doing popular culture, you follow the collectors. There are wacky people out there in the world who collect this stuff, who love it, who will know more about it than you will ever know, whatever particular thing. And one of the intriguing things is that they had followed the same kind of weird intellectual pattern that I had. These were people who started by collecting early race records and hillbilly records. You no longer can afford Robert Johnson 78s or, my guess, uh, Fiddlin' John Carson 78s. So they started collecting 78s from around the world. And then they started putting them in these weird bibliographies of everything that was, pop, you know, discographies or whatever. And so that was one way that I followed it. And at the beginning, it really does feel 10 years ago, it was very hard to find some of this stuff. Uh, some of people, but then uh, Jonathan Ward, who has this wonderful website, uh, excavated shellac and put up something every month, another one within thing. And so there are, those are people, I try to put them all in the footnotes or whatever that one depends on. The collectors often have a different purpose than thinking the kinds of issues here, but that was the... The, the other thing is that actually things have dramatically changed. 
Andrew Jones wrote a wonderful book called Yellow Music about the Shanghai music in China in the 1990s, in the 1930s, but he wrote it in the 1990s. At that time, he basically was unable to find any of the recordings. And his conclusion at that point was that they had been destroyed in years of revolution and cultural revolution in China and nobody had it. All of a sudden, in 2001, EMI finds in a warehouse in India a whole mess of the recordings that were recorded. And because all of a sudden there's a new interest in it, now you can go and buy these. EMI Hong Kong puts out all of these records. So records, sounds that were thought to be totally lost in 1995 are now easily available on the internet at this point. And that's actually been one of the experiences, you know, things that I spent days and weeks trying to get hold of. And now, oh yeah, that's easily there. I have two questions. Um, the first one is, uh, if you notice uh, differences in the consumption of this type of music in between uh, the American market and Europe, for example. Um, I don't know, I've been following, um, researching a bit more about dance, about the rumba craze, and I think that the markets, at least the way I observe it, are different, but in this case, you are looking at a more panoramic type of rhythm, so I, I have a lot of interest to know. And the other thing, um, I have, I struggle a bit with the term vernacular. Um, uh, in my culture, vernacular is similar to, is a synonym of uh, minstrel, so, but I am yeah. minstrel. So I am uh, getting accustomed to different definitions and uses of the term vernacular, but uh, to me it has been very interesting also, like some of the respondents mentioned like the other vernacular revolution in, in Europe in the 15th century, in that this, this entrance of, of you know, the folkloric or the popular into the mainstream or the higher class. Um, so my question is, uh, do you consider like the vernacular is also danceable? Could we, could you expand a bit about it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me take that one then. The, mar the markets I feel like are the hardest thing to try to figure out. And even there, I feel like what I've got in the book are an assembly of anecdotes of how how different records are turning up in different places. It, it doesn't seem to me that we've got really, oh, and uh, reviewers, that's the other thing. Uh, but even there, the record review doesn't really exist, or rather you get some of the earliest people writing about it. Most of the people who write about this music are writing either about live performances or still usually in the form of books that somebody pu publishes a collection of folk songs or whatever and that becomes it and so it, it's really trying to figure out the nature of the market so let me take the the vernacular one um, which is a there are a lot of uh, different connotations that are but I think actually most of them I would hold one. I do think that the main reason, let's see, the main reasons that I really want to suggest it is, and they're all complicated, is the sense that somehow this is large a change in thinking about music as what took place with the printing press and the rise of the vernacular languages, which was also not just a European thing. One also sees that in, in South Asia, where this essentially the move from Sanskrit to the any number of different languages that are linked in different ways with connections to Sanskrit. And the writings about the kind of vernacular transformation in South Asia, I found very powerful for, for a way of thinking this. I think there is in some, there are various ways of seeing an etymology of vernacular as actually having slave in its uh, etymology. And so I think there is a sense in which the vernacular has always been tied to a sense of ordinary people and people who are doing the work of a society often in unfree ways. And so that's another sense that I wanted. The third one is really that sense of the kind of the music as language. Music people 
keep arguing with this because that's a big <laughs> argument among musicologists is whether the linguistic metaphor is useful or is not useful. Uh, sometimes I feel like this book is what happens if you've basically been trained as a jazz <laughs> person and you're trying to figure out these other musics. And so uh, coming out of jazz where I think the sense really is of it as a language, one tries to learn how to speak it, one tries to be able to improvise and answer other people in that way that is a very powerful not all of some of these musics and the question of improvisation in these musics is a kind of crucial one that I, I try to to wrestle with and even the minstrel thing is though I would not that's certainly not the connotation that I would intend in the use of this which uh, and I'm and I, let me give one before that is the other thing is that the popular too often these musics is the other half of the argument that um, uh, Brent mentioned, but he didn't take it that way, is that people immediate link musics to peoples. So we have, even in the word popular music, the sense that each nation has a different kind of music. And for <laughs> me, that linguistic detour is a way not to reduce music to peoples while seeing there are some real connections. It is not easy to learn another language. And I think these musical idioms have some of that. And if you grow up in a particular language, you actually know that better than people who don't grow up in that language. And I think that some ways these are not easily adoptable music languages. It really takes training for people to both be able to perform in them and appreciate the music, and yet you can learn. We do have musicians who, Oscar Alleman, who is in some way kind of multilingual musician uh, and doing that. And so that is another reason why the vernacular metaphor is there. But it is also true that most of these musics are very closely tied to versions of minstrelsy. The vaudeville stage all around the world is tied. Even Um Kulthum has her, does a couple of her films. I have not seen these, and I don't think you can find these on YouTube, in blackface. And there's a whole kind of relation between North Africa and the rest of Africa that turns up in this. There's a whole thing in the same moment over the place of kind of gypsy uh, musics, and so that the minstrel element is a not insignificant part of this. I've always thought that a great book would be a real study of minstrelsy around the world. <laughs> that would be, this is, I'm always not uh -oh. the detail, I know. <laughs> but, but I do think that the varieties of that, and I, so in some sense, I think that would be in some ways why I think that there's a, there, that is another reason why these might actually carry some of that minstrel thing. And many of the reasons that the political people took their distance from it is because they saw these as versions of minstrelsy. Yeah. Really, a quick question? Um, so, uh, I've been waiting for this book for a while. I heard Decolonizing the Ear. I think that was the title of the talk some years ago. And I was sort of like, when is this book coming? And it's <laughs> finally here, but I haven't read it yet. But from what I heard today, um, I think um, a few remarks might be in, in order. Which is, when you scale things differently, it's interesting what happens from uh, one's scholarly perspective. So uh, what you're doing is looking at this particular moment of five years, really, and then uh, going global, right? What happens, though, if we, and I, too, uh, like you and Brent, uh, think that the battle of the year is somehow central to territorial decolonization. I probably would say it's relevant to aspects of a, you know, an effective <laughs> investment in it or something. I would back off further from where Brent was, we were backing off from you who was saying it's axiomatic. Um, but nevertheless, there's some, some ways in which it's relevant. But if we turn the question around and look at how music and sound and distribution and so on, whether it was through phonograph or radio and the, the relationship of, um, of, of, of technology to political movements, and we turn that around and it gets specific. So we now scale down a little bit. And we could do this again and scale down even further and look at particular genres, Marabi or something. How does that articulate to the state? And of course, it's much more complicated because there's some Marabi that was seen as like very problematic and other versions that were seen as kind of liberatory and so on. But let's just do the first version, which is scale down to the question of the relationship of music to decolonization movements in actual practice. And if I just take, for example, my, my work is more in traditional music, not vernacular music, and its political components more or less. But if we just compare, say, Zimbabwe and, uh, and Uganda, 
um, in terms of traditional music, it was almost like the traditional music had a completely antithetical relationship to decolonization. So in Zimbabwe, for example, because of the radio two ification, I mean, we, we, it's a hard it's a hard question to answer, but more or less. Um, traditional music became a kind of symbol of opposition uh, uh, at a certain moment within this movement, and uh, through timbre and so on, it was, you know, yes, Adorno, and, and uh, you know, maybe our fanons missed it, but the special servicemen of the Rhodesian Air Force didn't miss the fact that they were they were terrified by what was beamed in from Mozambique on 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 called called Voice of Zimbabwe, which was you know galvanizing the guerrilla warfare on the ground. Now, why was that? And they did, went to all sorts of lengths to try to stop the wattage and so on and so forth. And yet, most of what was being transmitted was music, okay, which is a, a fascinating sort of problem. So it wasn't like messaging as much as uh, sort of messaging through tonality or something, um, uh, or however we want to describe that. Um, and and, and it, so that, that's an interesting moment. Now, if you look at Uganda, the opposite happened. And that was that traditional music became rebuked because the older sort of class, the aristocratic class of musicians, and there was a great, wonderful tradition around the Kabaka um, and, the, and the courts around Luberi and so on, all of that got decimated and cut off and destroyed and burned and so on. Everyone was killed after Oboti took power because that was seen as a kind of co-option. They, 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 were, they, they were sort of cooperative, cooperative with colonial power, which was another. So if we look at, if we scale down just a little bit, the tonality and so on, it seems like we're in a much more precarious zone than, um, than, than the kind that we can afford when we're looking at the phenomenon from the perspective that, that you are, which I think raises all the right questions, and this would be a sign in our bibliographies and so on and so forth, but partly also <laughs> to, say, to say no at strategic points, um, and usefully no. Um, when we look at the relationship in a little more detail, it, beca it becomes, you know, timbres and so on, and whether they are locally inflected, whether they are techno terroir, all of these aspects of what we need to think about when we think about audio um, uh, uh, in, in relationship to, to political meaning, um, I think they become much more multifaceted and, and complex uh, than simply decolonizing um, and so on. So that's just one thing I wanted to, to, uh, to raise um, as, 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 as sort of coming out of this analysis. When we, when we scale differently, things look different and sound different and so on. I might have Let me just say short, one sorry. small That's thing on that, that, which is um, I hope that when I actually talk about the specifics of specific musics in specific places that one will find I try to pay attention to exactly those um, ambiguities and, that, and, that's, and not just put them all in one thing. But on the other end, the scale thing is something that's quite interesting because I do think part of this is a project of can one register a cultural revolution which probably takes a century to actually have its impact over something that happened over a five-year period. That's really the trick of the book. And that's kind of like at two totally different time scales. And I talk about that at some point. About, and partly because even the musicians are come out of it with a life scale like we do, that we you know, learn certain music and then you know, we can never listen to hip hop or something or like that, or whatever it is that finally we can't listen to or whatever. But I do think, I guess the other part, and I guess that would be in some way a response to something that Ben said at the beginning was, I want to stress the way in which song, recorded song and dance, which is an odd thing, because it's not a dance where you go to a dance. You're listening to a piece of shellac that has the name of the dance on it, and it's an instrumental thing. And, and on the other hand, all these music have the distinction between their kind of lyric song form and their up-tempo dance form, and that those are not song and dance in the kind of long sense. And you listen to it in a kind of distracted way, because it's not just in the home. The evidence is usually for working class communities. It's in bodegas, it's in bars, it's in cafes, it's on the street. People are trying to get you into their store by playing these records. And so it becomes a kind of soundtrack to daily life. And that, I think, is a different kind of reconstruction of, and that the sense, if your music, in the point that you made, is actually now all over the soundscape of the city, that's a different kind of political decolonization and something that maybe was not able to be seen by the more 
straightforwardly political figures. Mm -hmm. At least that's kind of the argument mm -hmm. of it. It's a really good point. <coughs> right, so two things. First, uh, that uh, following the end notes in this book, there's an excellent playlist. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> if you uh, missed anything that you wanted to remember, and the playlist you can do is on Spotify, so you can actually exactly. <laughs> all in. And also, you, if uh, you you can purchase the book uh, with a discount outside. So uh, join us now for some wine and cheese. And I want to thank Michael, Brett, um, Alex, and Ben for.